processing. Right. Uh, good evening, good afternoon, good morning, wherever you are. Uh, and thank you so much for joining us today. My name is Sandra Masharia, and I am the chief of the Africa section here at the Department of Global Communications. And uh, we are just so excited that uh, you're joining us today. Uh, first, because it's Africa month, the month of May, and this is because this is the month when the Organization of African Unity was established some 59 years ago in Addis Ababa on the 25th of May. And, um, and so we are also marking this, this uh, with this webinar, the African Union's theme of the year, which is food security and nutrition. And, uh, and so that's why we're excited that we have, we have the, the moderator and the guest speaker that we have uh, today. Second, of course, um, wherever you are in the world, I'm sure everyone has been touched some way, affected some way by the pandemic. And so we are still living with the impact of the pandemic in terms of food insecurity. And uh, when you now add the impact of the war in Ukraine, we see that food insecurity is, is um, increasing around the world and in Africa, of course, specifically. And our colleagues, at, our partners at the Economic uh, Commission for Africa uh, estimate that food prices reached a 14 year high in March of this year. And so this webinar is, is very timely. Uh, our platform here at Africa Renewal, uh, we aim, we are very solutions oriented. We aim to inform, engage and inspire action towards the sustainable development goals and the agenda uh, 2063 of the African Union. And uh, we're I'm excited again that you're here for this webinar. Our last two webinars, uh, one was on the uh, outcome of COP26, the climate talks in Glasgow last year, what the outcome meant for Africa. The other one that we had earlier this year focused on the opportunities for young people in the African continental free trade area. And today uh, we will be uh, talking about uh, food insecurity and nutrition. And so we are looking forward to spending this hour with you this Friday and thank you for joining us. And without much ado, I will go into introducing our moderator for today. And I am excited for you all to meet Ms. Chinyeye Juliet Ejezie from Nigeria. She is the founder and CEO, CEO Chief Executive Officer of Doslet Anim Farms in Nigeria. She is a champion of women and youth participation in agriculture. She's currently the country coordinator for the Climate Smart Agriculture Youth Network a civil society organization and one of our partners, we're happy to say. And she is also the West African Hub Coordinator for Women in Agriculture for Sustainable Agriculture. She has trained several young people and women on sustainable agriculture. In March of 2021, last year, ahead of the UN Food System Summit, Ms. Ijezie convened an independent dialogue. And the report of the dialogue is available at the link we I would like to just hang over, hand over to Chine Ejezie, over to you, and thank you so much. Okay, thank you so much, Sandra. And once again, we welcome everyone to this webinar organized by the Africa Renewal, in which we are going to discuss on empowering African women farmers and agripreneurs to boost food security. The truth is that the potential of African women to contribute to food security cannot be overemphasized. Um, this is because women constitute a greater percentage of the available workforce in agriculture. Well, however, agricultural productivity has been low. And we know that the targets of United Nations Sustainable Development Goals number two is to end hunger and ensure access to safe, nutritious, and um, sufficient food for all, all year round. And also to end all forms of malnutrition and address the nutritional needs of adolescent girls, pregnant and lactating women, including older persons, doubling the agricultural productivity and income of small scale food producers, with particular emphasis on women and family farmers. And similarly, the African Union 
has declared this year 2022, just like Sandra mentioned, as the year of nutrition. And the adopted team is actually to strengthen resilience in nutrition and food security on the African continent, strengthening agro food systems, health and social protection systems for the isolation of human, social, and economic capital development. So the Africa Renewal organized this uh, webinar to promote this AU team for 2022. And it is aimed at deepening an understanding of issues related to food security and uh, food insecurity actually, and identifying steps that countries, organizations, and individuals can take to empower women on the front line of African agriculture. Um, personally, my experience in the various training sessions I've had in Women in Agriculture for Sustainable Africa for the African women, we've discovered that knowledge gap is a major contributor to the low agricultural productivity of farmers. That means that many women lack proper information on improved varieties on crop and livestock species for higher yield. Also, there is knowledge gap on how to process their primary outputs for value addition, and also a gap in available financial services and market information. All this limit the ability to take advantage at the advantage of available opportunities in the agro sector. So empowering African women to overcome all these challenges will certainly boost food security and bring, um, and bring us closer to achieving the sustainable development goals of zero hunger and goal five, which is gender equality and women empowerment. So today I will encourage everyone to participate fully and also contribute by typing in your questions in the comments in the chat room. Um, there will be time for questions and answers when the questions will be answered by our guest speaker. You're only required to tell us your name and your country, where you are writing from, um, why sending in your comments. So having mentioned that, it will now be my pleasure to introduce our guest speaker for today's discussion in the person of Dr. Jemima Njuki. Dr. Jemima Njuki is currently the Chief of the Economic Empowerment Section at UN Women. She's a recognized leader on gender equality and women's empowerment, having directed global initiatives promoting women's economic empowerment. Dr. Njuki previously worked at the International Food Policy Research Institute as the Director for Africa. In recent years, she has led the UN Food System Summit, Gender Equality, and Women's Empowerment Level of Change, and was instrumental in establishing the coalition to make food systems work for women and girls. Additionally, she led the design and deployment of the Global Food 5050, an indicator and mechanism for gender responsibility for organizations engaged in global food systems. She has also led the gender equality work with the International Development Research Center, including the design of the growth and economic opportunities for women, the Women in Agriculture Program at Care USA, and the Poverty, Gender, and Impact Program at the International Livestock Research Institute. So without much delay, I would like to give the floor to Dr. Jemima Njoki, who will discuss the topic before us today empowering African women farmers and entrepreneurs to boost food security. Over to you, Dr. Jemima. Thank you so much, uh, Chineye. Thank you so much, uh, Sandra, and everyone for having me. It's a real pleasure for me to join you um, this morning to talk about a topic that is very close and very dear um, to my heart. I have been working on these issues for many years. How do we empower women who are working in uh, agriculture? So it's really a pleasure for me to be able to provide some thoughts um, on that to the, to the community that's joining. Sorry, we can't hear you. 
Oh, sorry about that, Jine. I hadn't. It's it's interesting that after being on Zoom and Teams and online platforms for two and a half years, I still forget to unmute myself. <laughs> Okay. Yeah, yeah. So thank you so much, um, Chinaya, for that uh, introduction. Thank you so much, Sandra, and your team for, for inviting me to this session to talk about a topic that's really, really dear and close to my heart. I have been very excited to see the African Union designate 2022 the year of food security and nutrition. It is very welcome. And it is our expectation that we really bring some of these issues to the forefront uh, during this year and that we have a continental mobilization of efforts and resources um, to address to address this. I'm also really appreciative of this platform because it does provide us um, a space uh, to discuss some of these issues, but more importantly, to 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 have a conversation with with the young, uh, you know, with youth organisations, with civil society organisations, with governments, women rights organisations about the the role that we can all play to make sure that this topic of food insecurity, especially in our region, uh, ceases to be um, a topic in the future. Because I I believe very very strongly that the biggest indignity um, of, of our times um, is the fact that a huge majority of our population cannot meet the basic needs um, of, um, of food, of adequate nutrition. There's a lot of indignity in hunger. There is indignity in people not being able to feed themselves or to feed their, um, their families. So I, I find this designation really, really um, important. I've been working on issues of gender equality and the empowerment of women in our agriculture and food systems for a, for, for, for a long time. Uh, what I can say is we are making progress, but not enough progress. Um, I, I am excited <coughs> that we do have a global uh, framework that really connects our SDG 5 on gender equality to our SDG 2 on zero, um, on zero hunger. So in a way, the, 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 there is um, that overarching global framework within which uh, we can situate this work and, and this designation of, of this year as, um, as the year of food security and nutrition by the Africa Union also provides us that regional momentum to actually address some of these, some of these issues. So we know from data, and I'm not going to go a lot into the statistics, I'm sure a lot of us who are engaged in, in matters of food and nutrition security have this data at our fingertips, that we have over 800 million people that are hungry, um, and, and that is data uh, before even the, the war in, in Ukraine. COVID-19 has increased these, these numbers. The war in Ukraine is likely to even increase not these numbers uh, further because we know the role that Ukraine actually plays in, um, in global food production and global food supply, supply of major commodities like I'm sorry, can you please unmute again? So let me talk very much more specifically um, about, um, about women. So we know women are key actors in food production. I actually often say that the image of African agriculture, the phase of African agriculture, the phase of African food systems is actually women. Um, even now, if you go on to Google and, and Google African food production, the likelihood that most of the images you will see are of women and hoes, women in their land, women as, as, as small food processes. That's a lot of what you're going to see. So the face, we know the face of our agriculture is African women they are key actors they are everywhere in that in that space but i would like to qualify the everywhere because even 
um, with that qualification, we still have a lot of fundamental questions um, that we've been grappling with, especially the last um, the last couple of years. And I just want to highlight these questions because I would like them to frame um, our conversation after my, my, my few remarks. One is, my most fundamental question is why are farmers, the producers of food, our small scale African farmers, still the hungriest people in the world? Why are the people producing our food facing food shortages? Why are they the most hungry? That's one big question that I would like us to reflect on as I speak. The second big question that I want us to be reflecting on is, why are women, we are saying that women are the face of African agriculture. Why are they still producing food on land that they do not own? With resources that are not adequate. Second fundamental question to reflect on. That fundamental question to reflect on. If women are 50% of our populations, if we are saying they're the face of agriculture and the face of food systems, why are our financial institutions still not delivering, designing, delivering products that work for the women? who are in food systems? Why are they still treating agriculture loans as though they were mortgage loans to purchase a house? And the fourth fundamental question I want us to be reflective of. We say a lot of the labor um, in agriculture in Africa is provided by women. Globally, it's about 53%, but across our region, we see this percentage ranging from that 43%, sometimes to almost 80% in countries like Burundi in, in, in Eastern and Southern Africa, lower percentages in Western Central and Central Africa. Why doesn't the leadership of our food systems, of our organizations, of our ministries of agriculture, of our ministries of trade, of our um, agencies. Why isn't that leadership reflective of this role that women are playing in agriculture? Why are our research institutions not led by women? Why do we still have only about 25% of our agricultural researchers as women? We are schizophrenic in the way we are treating women in agriculture, and that needs to stop. So let me then talk about what we've been doing and what my role has been in trying to resolve some of these issues. And the audience, please, I would like you to reflect on these questions, not in terms of what the problem is, but where do we go from here, right? So about two years ago, I was appointed to lead the, U the gender work of the UN Food Systems um, Summit. And the special envoy, Dr. Agnes Kalibata, reached out to me and said, we cannot have another global conversation on food systems where gender equality and women's empowerment are not central. And so I worked with a group of women rights organizations, um, other experts from the continent and beyond to mobilize the voices of women um, so that we could have an input in the UN Food Systems Summit. So that gender equality could be a critical element um, of, of, of the work of the UN Food Systems Summit. Um, and we had three distinct mandates. Well, I got uh, three mandates as my, my, my marching orders. One, mobilize women from around the world. And I had dialogues in Africa. We had Africa dialogues. We had dialogues in Latin America. We had dialogues in Central Europe, all over the world to hear the voices of women. 
and not just focused on what are the problems that women have, but what do women want? What do women want the UN Food Systems Summit to deliver for them? What solutions would they propose that governments act on? What solutions would they propose that financial institutions act on? So that was one of the mandates. The second mandate was make sure the outcomes of the UN Food System Summit, whether they are on finance, whether they are on climate resilience, whether they are on consumption, whether they are on production, whether they are on innovation, that those outcomes critically address the needs and priorities of women. And so we had a mechanism to make sure that every single process of the UN Food System Summit, the champions, the action coalitions, that there was a gender representative who was making sure that gender was mainstreamed into all these processes, including the science group that we had, gender researchers that were sitting in the science group to make sure the evidence of what works for women was also reflected in their recommendations. The third matching order was we need key priorities around gender to unlock some of these issues that we've been talking about. Yeah. What are the three, four things that we need to mobilize around to make sure that these issues of gender inequality in food systems, 30 years from now, we are not talking about the same issues. Because I can tell you when I was a student studying gender, and, and you, you can tell I am not very young, the same issues I'm talking about today is the same issues we were talking about 20 years ago. As I said, we are making progress, but not enough, uh, not first, not first enough. So that third mandate was what are the four critical issues that we need to address to make sure that our food systems are equitable, they are inclusive, they benefit, they engage women and girls in ways that are meaningful for them, in ways that improve their livelihoods, in ways that empowers, empowers them. And the whole idea behind that, that, that mandate was that women are already working in food systems. We've seen them. Those of you that come from rural areas, you've seen women on those farms. So this is not about women participating in food systems. They are already participating. They are there. They are running small businesses. They are who you find in the, in the markets. So why aren't our systems working for them? Why aren't our governments working for them? Why aren't our um, food systems organizations working for them? Why aren't our financial institutions designing, uh, designing for them? And so those, for, those issues then became um, the background or the content of the coalition on making food systems work for women and girls. And those are the issues we are implementing, taking forward. So I'm going to talk about those four priority issues um, in, in a couple of minutes, just so that I can open this up for, for discussion and to hear other people's views. So one um, is around policies, making sure that our food systems policies, whether they're agriculture, trade, climate change, fisheries, that they are gender responsive. And when I say gender responsive, it is not that they include a paragraph on gender somewhere on page 55 of the policy, is that gender is well mainstreamed, that there are budget allocations for uh, work on gender equality, that they take a feminist perspective, that from the onset, from defining what the problem they are trying to address is, that gender, the issues of women and girls are integrated, and that that flows all the way through, including to budget, uh, budget allocation. So making sure that we are also seeing gender responsive budgeting within the ministries of agriculture, of trade, of nutrition, wherever those ministries are that are dealing with food systems. So that was one very concrete thing. We've seen government adopt feminist international policies, 
countries like Sweden, Canada, we want to see how can we uh, around the world, including in Africa, have gender responsive food systems policies. So very concrete action for governments. The second action was for financial institutions. And it was for financial institutions to develop gender transformative financial products that work for women. And we gave some very, very concrete examples here of what this could potentially look like. And I want you to reflect on this. If a financial institution gives a loan, if as a woman you go to the bank because you need a loan to start a pottery business, the first hurdle you're gonna get is they need collateral for that loan, yeah? Collateral in form of land, collateral in form of, you know, car, car, car log books, whatever it is, but they require collateral. So if you're starting a pottery business and you don't have that collateral, there you face the first handle. You are already facing handles of people thinking, uh, uh, did you get your permission from your husband to, to, to come get a, a loan from the bank? Eh? That's another handle. Eh? But the biggest handle is that even if you go through those hoops and get a loan, you will be required to start monthly payments at the end of the month when you get that loan. Now, imagine you got that loan to buy day old chicks because you want to start a pottery business. At the end of the month, do you know how old your day old chicks from last month are? They are just 30 day old chicks. Not a single one has started laying eggs. So how are you going to be paying that loan at the end of the first month of when you get that loan? Huh? So those loans, those financial products have be, to be designed in a way that they actually address the priorities and needs of women. The third thing was about accountability in food systems organizations, including governments for gender equality. And gender equality in terms of making sure that there's leadership in, the, in those organizations, that there are policies that work for women in those organizations, and that the work is that they're doing impacts on women and girls. And so we developed an accountability index. It's called the Global Food 5050. It is out there every year. We are adding more organizations. We launched it at the, at the UN Food System Summit. Um, this year, we are adding more organizations in its second uh, anniversary. We are launching it again in September. And this will be an accountability mechanism. And let me tell you, organizations already started reaching out to say, what do I need to do to stop being at the bottom of the table? Because that's the accountability that we need. And we are hoping that this accountability mechanism becomes even an index for African governments that when they meet in, 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 in Addis Ababa, for their heads of state summit, they are looking at a table that shows them where they are in terms of women's leadership in their, in their, in their, in their structures. And the third area was around all other organizations working in food systems, whether they're NGOs, whether it's Farm Africa, whether it's Care International, where that they start adopting what we call gender transformative approaches as they work with women. That they are not just doing agriculture, but they have to think about the gender issues around agriculture. They have to have approaches that change the norms, the behaviors, um, the gaps, the, the close the gaps that we see on, uh, on, on inequalities. Now, these four issues form the mandate of the making food system, the coalition on making food systems work for women, um, for women and, 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 and girls. So that I'm, I'm, I'm going to stop there. This coalition is now in its formation stage. I, I, form, I, I led it um, as part of my mandate to the UN Food System Summit. And now we are in the process of really institutionalizing that coalition within the UN-based uh, uh, organizations, FAO, IFA, WFP. And we are going to be contributing to that as well from, from UN Women. So. When I joined UN Women, a lot of this work I'm carrying forward with me because part of my team actually works on sustainable development, including climate change and climate resilience. 
Jinenye, I'm going to stop there and I apologize for the delay in, in the start of, um, of, of, of my talk. We are also discussing engagement in COP27. That's why I had a, a couple of minutes delay uh, joining you, but I'm going to stop there so that we can have some conversation around some of these issues because I'm sure the audience has been reflecting on them and probably have a lot to say about not just these four solutions that I have had highlighted, but others that they might be already trying and, and seeing in the work they're doing. Back to you, Jinenya. Wow. OK, thank you so much, Dr. Jemima, um, for this your wonderful, insightful presentation. And I believe that we've all gained a lot from your experience and expertise. And it's so good to hear that the um, the, there are ministries and the work you've been doing help to address all these issues that have to do with gender inequalities. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. And I think it is time for us to start taking questions. The question, the first question from, okay, doesn't have a name. But the first question we have here is directed to you, Dr. Jemima. The, the, the person is asking, is there a framework for training small farmers on plant and animal health systems, risk analysis, and avoiding post-harvest loss? So that's the question. Let me take that again. Is there a framework for training small farmers on plant and animal health systems, risk analysis, and avoiding post-harvest loss? Okay. Um, so from in uh, there are a lot of organizations right now that are currently addressing issues of post harvest loss. Let me let me start with post harvest loss because it's 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 much more it's much more common. It's a huge challenge in our continent. It's related to, to trade. It is related to um, post-harvest production uh, practices. It is related to access to technologies to reduce those post-harvest losses. And I know there is a couple of organizations, including our own, uh, our own governments. I come from Kenya um, myself, and I know, for example, like at the University of, of, of Nairobi, they have a huge, it's led by a good friend of, 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 of mine called Professor Jay Nambuko, who's working a lot on technologies for reducing post-harvest losses, but also making sure that those technologies are accessible. Uh, to smallholder farmers. They run a lot of training programs, not just directly for smallholder farmers, but also for the organizations, NGOs that are working. Um, that are working on the ground with smallholder farmers. I know funders like USID, the Rockefeller Foundation, have uh, huge programs that are focused on on post harvest uh, post harvest um, losses. So there's a lot of information out there. There's a lot of agencies that are actually addressing the issues of post harvest losses. Um, in terms of of, of animal um, animal health, there is also organization like the International Livestock Research Institute, where I used to work um, many, many years ago, that are actually having programs on, uh, on, on, animal, uh, on animal health. One of the very interesting things that I have seen on, on animal health, and I joined them in a webinar a couple of days ago, is that is that they are trying to get more women into being veterinarians and into being community animal health workers because that's also an area in this agenda of getting more women into uh, research organizations but also into professions that they haven't been uh, before 
um, they have a whole program get training women to be community animal health workers and breaking some of those barriers. It was interesting to hear a lot of the norms around that. For example, one from Ghana was talking about how people believe if you go into the animal crawl when you are in your menstruation periods that the, 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 the animals will die or become infertile. And so seeing these young women with motorcycles going around communities um, doing vaccinations and animal health work and changing some of those perspectives uh, was actually quite, uh, quite exciting. So there's a lot happening in that area. Okay. Thank you so much for your response. Um, let's go over to the next question. Okay, the one we have here says nearly a third of the world's cropland is losing topsoil faster than new soil is forming. This reduces the land's inherent fertility. Thus, future food production is also strengthened by soil, soil erosion. Are there plans on soil rehabilitation and rehabilitation programs? Please let me take that again. He's asking, are there plans on soil rehabilitation programs? So please, can you kindly respond to it? Um, so I will be very honest. I have worked with a lot of soil scientists, but I'm not a soil scientist myself. I think the perspective I can give to that is we have to look at our production all the way from the soil to the plate. And so investments in soil fertility, uh, investments in land rehabilitation, all those are critical elements of, um, of making sure we are, we, are, we are reducing this gap between the amount of food that we are producing and what the, our global needs for, for food are. So having that perspective where you're looking at all the way from the soil to, to the plate is really, really critical. And I believe there's a lot of organizations, including research organizations that are working on issues of soil fertility. Um, one of the things to note is that these issues are going to be much more critical with the with the war in 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 Ukraine that a lot of our fertilizers um, the continent imports a lot of our fertilizers we are going to see some disruptions in those supply chains and so uh, it's going to be even more important to start thinking about what we call integrated soil fertility management where we are not just thinking about the inorganic sources of um, of soil fertility but also the organic sources that that African farmers have actually always uh, practiced and this integration is actually going to be much more um, much more important but to be making sure that those are available as, as I said to women farmers um, to women farmers as well that we are also building the capacity of women farmers to be able to use some of these uh, technologies and techniques. Okay, thank you very much once again. Okay, that will take us to the third question. Okay, this question says, can you please comment on strengthening safety nets to ensure that vulner vulnerable farmers have access to basic needs to maintaining agricultural production? Let me take that again. Can you comment on strengthening safety nets to ensure that vulnerable farmers have access to the basic needs to maintaining agricultural production. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Now I've got it. Um, so actually one of the things that I'm working on in my current role is uh, expanding social protection. We call them expanding social protection flaws. And this has actually become even more important with COVID-19 when a lot of people lost their, their, their jobs. Uh, many women lost their jobs because as you know, uh, women are more likely to be in some of the informal sectors and the sectors that were most affected by, uh, by COVID-19. And so social protection becomes then a critical, um, a, a critical part of the, of, of the solution. 
Now, what we've actually seen across the world, including in Africa, is a huge expansion of social protection and social safety nets during COVID. And what we are working to do is to make, and with governments, is to make sure that uh, these levels are maintained or even increased. So, for example, there are countries we saw a huge increase, not just in the coverage of social safety nets and social protection, but also in the levels. Um, so, so, you know, countries uh, moving from where they were giving things like 20 to $50 uh, per family uh, you know, really doing an assessment of what does it actually take for a family to have to sustain themselves on a monthly basis, and we've even seen some countries double their their. Um, their, their social protection amounts or the social safety nets that they provide to families because of doing some of those uh, some of those calculations. So our our huge challenge right now is to make sure that post COVID and and of course <laughs> uh, hoping that there'll be a post COVID because we really are still during uh, COVID, but really hoping that post COVID that governments can actually not only maintain the level was that they are currently at, but that they can increase that. Um, and more importantly, that we can expand the coverage, uh, what we call those, those flaws of who's covered by social, social safety nets. Because in a lot of cases, social safety nets have been, governments have reserved social safety nets either for, 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 for the elderly or people in very vulnerable situations like conflict situations and humanitarian situations, but to also have this, um, coverage broadened to include even those that are in active engagement, including active engagement in agriculture, but for the moment cannot sustain their, 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 their livelihoods, either because they're not producing enough or, um, um, or they do not have um, enough to eat. So it's, it's really expanding those, those coverage flaws, if, if, you, if you may wish to call them that that's the language we're using at the UN, making sure that we are expanding the coverage flaw of social safety, social safety nets, and that the definition of who qualifies for social safety nets and social protection is not too narrow as to lock out a lot of vulnerable populations who actually um, could benefit from those social safety nets. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, we have another question here from Will Betts from Zimbabwe. Will Betts says the continent is now under the African Continental Free Trade Agreement, which is going to produce some challenges and opportunities for all African member states. The question now is, how are women farmers going to be capacitated in order to fully benefit from this dispensation? in the face of possible competition from multinational companies. Should I take it again? No, I have, it. I have also seen it on the, on the chat, so I've read that one. Um, thank you so much, Wilbert, for that question because it's very, very important. So um, the African continent of free trade agreement actually provides such a huge opportunity, first generally because it really expands um, the African market so that Af and, and starts standardizing some of the protocols so that Africa can actually trade with itself. Yeah, and trade it with itself in a way um, that is conducive um, for, for, for people in, in, in Africa, because sometimes the huge, the biggest taxation is actually between our own African countries to the extent that it's become easier to trade with the outside world than internally with ourselves. So this is actually a huge, huge, huge milestone for the, for, for, for the continent. 
Now, there are several ways in which um, we, we are working to get the gender and focus on women in the African continent of free trade agreement. First, from the perspective of traders, because we know a lot of the traders who are actually moving goods across countries, especially cross-border uh, women. If you go to, the, to any of our borders, the border between Kenya and Tanzania, the border between Ghana and Burkina Faso, you will find it's a lot of women who are doing a lot of the informal trade and informal movement of, of goods. So there is that recognition that in addition to the formal tariffs that are under discussion in the protocols, that there is attention to what's happening in cross-border trade and that government start establishing and streamlining some of that informal trade that is going on between countries in order to benefit, um, to benefit women. The second part of this is with UNECA, UN Women, and a couple of other agencies, we are supporting the Secretariat of the African Free Trade Agreement to develop a women's protocol. Yeah. So there is actually a very specific women's protocol that is under development now. And the idea behind that protocol is to make sure that the issues of women, that the engagement of women, the participation of women, that they are not left behind, that there are very clear mechanisms to support women to engage in the African continent of free trade agreement. That's the second part. The third part is that we want to then mainstream gender in all the other protocols, whether it's the manufacturing protocol, whether it's the tourism protocol, the gender is actually mainstreamed in these protocols. And I'll just say, for example, one of the tools and mechanisms we are hoping to integrate into some of those protocols is called gender responsive procurement. And gender responsive procurement is really requiring companies, including the big companies that are trading across the continent, that they are procuring from women-owned businesses and women enterprises, including women smallholder firms, right? So that's a tool or a mechanism that then starts ensuring that um, women, in, whether they are owning small businesses or whether they are, they are firmers, that they actually have access to the African continental uh, free trade agreement um, uh, benefits. It's going to take a lot of some time and working through these issues, but the, the idea is that at full implementation, that the gender component and the, and the support to women is fully integrated in the, in, the, in the protocols that are being developed as part of the, of the broader um, agreement and broader framework for, for, for trade. I'll leave it at those couple of examples, but there's also a lot going on, um, going on there. Okay, thank you so much. And it is very exciting to know that a lot have been done to make sure that women benefit in this opportunity. Okay, now we have one more question. We have more, one more question from Anonymous. Of African research of yields, better storage and markets. Repeat that again. I missed the part of that, the first part of that, Chinanya. Okay, I will take that again. <laughs> what is the role of African research organizations in training women farmers get markets? The role of African is get increased yields and better storage okay. as well as market. Okay. okay. So the role okay. of African research institutions. Um, so, so the, our research institutions play two, two roles. One, they play the role of just generating knowledge, innovations that work for, uh, for the African continent. And this is very important because we need technologies and solutions that actually work for our farmers. Sometimes something imported from Brazil or from China may or may not work for our context. And, and really, it's very important the role that our African researchers are actually playing in knowing what the 
uh, needs and priorities for us are and actually providing solutions for that. So I'll give you an example. Uh, I, I used to work for IDRC. I, I worked there for about eight years supporting African um, African researchers to, to, you know, to work with smallholder farmers. Things like um, developing bean varieties that cook faster because we know how we cook our beans it's a lot of firewood it's a lot of water a lot of that firewood and water is collected by women and girls so how do you work with researchers to actually develop bean varieties that cook for a shorter um for a shorter time that's research that's geared towards our own um our own context so there is a lot of role for African researchers in making sure that those solutions that they are developing work for farmers, but even more specifically that they work for women farmers and address their needs and priorities. That is one thing. The second thing is, um, and, and this is a challenge that we know we need to address. Everybody that's in this meeting that is from the African an African country will know how our extension systems used to work 20, 30 years ago. We are having a crisis of extension of how you move the products of research from research organizations to farmers because our extension systems are underfunded and we are having a sort of like we are having this break in our system where before researchers would, would develop the research products, work with extension agents, and then the extension agents would deliver these to smallholder farmers, would train smallholders on farmers on how to use this. We need huge reinvestments back into the extension, into the extension system, because I don't think we should be expecting, and they are really doing um, a lot in terms of directly working with farmers, directly engaging with farmers, directly taking those solutions to, to farmers. But our our research of farmer capacity, uh, our research of farmer ratio is just too low for that to be our way of doing of doing things so we really do need huge reinvestments back into the extension system we need huge reinvestments into digital uh, we need huge investments in digital um, digital communication and digital tools so that we can take advantage and we've already started seeing a lot of that use of digital tools to to either uh, provide information to to farmers uh, uh, give information on technologies and 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 things like training weather forecast market access um, but we also have to be careful that that access to technology is also not all uh, equal. If companies are designing things that require use of smartphones, the penetration of smartphones is still much lower in the continent than 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 elsewhere. We need to make sure we are using language that is accessible to 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 farmers, including women women farmers, so that we are not creating another gap. You know, we say we have a, an agriculture productivity gap, but if we are not careful in the way we also use technologies and especially digital tools, we can then add on that technology and an additional technology layer uh, gap and actually widen the gap further instead of of, uh, of closing it. So to just have that awareness that well, digital tools are providing us with with a huge. Um, with a huge opportunity that we also need to make sure that they are not creating an additional disparity, especially with uh, with access in rural areas, access for women, access in remote parts of, of countries where uh, technology penetration is not as, um, as high. Okay, thank you so much, um, Dr. Jemima, for all the wonderful responses you've given to the um to all the questions from the participants i must say that um, the responses are very suitable and um my suggestion is that um women farmers attend all events and be given the highest respect and translation facilities and languages they understand but there is need for them to be trained to get the required um, information they need 
the right um, knowledge, um, the right skills to run all their farming businesses profitably well. So thank you so much, Dr. Jemima. Thank you right from the inspiring presentation you made and um, the way you handled all the questions. I believe that a lot of the participants who join us today have really gained a lot. So thank you. And I will kindly request that you just give us some, your, the summary kind of a take home message mm -hmm. for all the participants listening. Um, thank you very much, Chinenye. Um, I think one key message I wanna leave you with is that women in Africa are really doing their part in agriculture and food systems. I keep saying even to young people, some of the reasons we are in school, we went to school, some of the reasons why we are holding the positions we are holding today is agriculture and our mothers that saved, sold hens and goats and maize and beans <laughs> to put us where we are today. The positions, the systems that we are managing today as people who are working in organizations, we need to make sure that those systems work for women. If you are in a financial institution, you need to make sure that those financial institutions are working for women, that they are designing and delivering for women. If you are in government, you need to make sure that your programs, your policies, are working for women, that they integrate the needs and priorities of women, because it is all our individual actions in the institutions where we sit with the power that we hold, however small that power is and however big that power is, that we need to change the way institutions are working for women. We need to make sure that we actually fix those systems so that they work for um, they work for women. This business of saying women's participation in this and that women are participating. We are the ones that are not creating those uh, those uh, those spaces at policy level, at institutional level, and we need to see that participation in production in small scale food processing and trading, we need to see that level of participation and engagement at the higher levels as well. We do not have enough women um, leading our food systems organizations. Actually, our first index showed that only 6% of, of those holding CEO and board chair levels in food systems organizations are women from low and middle income countries. Those numbers need to change. And I believe we all have a role to play in, in making sure that that happens. Okay, thank you so much. Um, for that closing remark. And um, right now, ladies and gentlemen, I would like to thank you all for your participation in today's webinar. This has really been an exciting and robust conversation from our guest speaker and her responses to all your questions. And I would like to especially thank her uh, for inspiring us with her experience and expertise particularly we, the women farmers, because I'm also a farmer and also the male in our midst. So I believe that we've gotten the right information that to encourage us more in sustainable agriculture. Um, secondly, my thanks go to the organizers, the African session of the United Nations Department of Global Communications. I am also informed that other events are coming up and I hope to, I hope that all of us that participated in today's events, we also join in the future events. And do not forget to follow Africa Renew on Twitter and Facebook. Just check in the chat room, the link will be posted. And um, I think this brings us to the end of the webinar. Hope you enjoy the rest of your day. Once again, thank you so much for joining. Thank you so much, Chine and, and Jemima. Thank you so much. That was very insightful. And thank you for having me, Sandra. All right, bye everyone.